Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simons. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Morning, Kathy. How's it going today? Good morning, Chris. I'm having a fantastic day. I have for you a tiny little update. Oh, do you tell? Yeah, yeah. Our last um, podcast that we did, you know, we did with um, Austin Rue's family, the two-legged dog, Austin Rue. Yes. And after the podcast, the woman who drove Austin Rue from Texas uh, to Maryland reached out to us to thank us uh, for featuring Austin Rue on our show and for mentioning her. Um, and I said, well, she was the true hero here. You know, she started mm-hmm. the ball rolling. And it was just nice to hear from the woman who who saw the light in Austin Rue and um, got him to his, you know, his new forever family. So it was really a feel good uh, moment. <laughs> Yeah, and it was kind of full circle for her because she knew that he'd been adopted and he found his forever family, but, you know, ultimately she did not know, you know, his entire story and how he's become such an ambassador, but she did share how she saw him on the Bissell commercial and recognized him after all these years. Right. And she's like, I, you know, from the tip of the, the white tip on his tail to the markings on his chest, she's like, that's gotta be him. That's gotta be him. But she wasn't convinced until she heard our, our right. podcast. So indeed that was a great, great, uh, heartwarming story. And I think my podcast team partner, uh, got a little tears in her eyes when she uh, read oh, that. Oh, I did. It made me feel so good. Um, so if, if you haven't, um, if you haven't heard our episode on, uh, Rooting for Austin Rue. Um, check it out. It's it's a great story. It's a great story. Yep. And then today, Chris, I am I'm so happy about today's show because we are going to be talking with Dr. Lisa Schmidt about senior fitness. Such an important topic. Um, right. And Kathy, some people may not even think those two words belong together. Oh, senior and fitness. Right. So right. Mm-hmm, listen up, people. But, but, But here's the thing, senior dogs need to have, they need to have good core strength, they need good balance, they need good flexibility, they need body awareness, it's all essential to everyday living. And and you're right, I think that there may be a misconception that senior dogs are too old for exercise. Mm -hmm. Or they should just be put out to pasture, right? Just let them rest, just, you know. And um, I've heard it within our own, you know, veterinary community, you know, oh, this dog's, you know, too old. Um, And obviously, you know, I I disagree. And and that's not to say I would take a senior dog and, you know, run them on the treadmill for a half an hour. But (laughs) but, but there are, right? But there are some simple things, simple exercises that owners can do uh, with their dog that are safe and fun and that are good for the body as well as the brain. And it impacts their overall well being. Yeah. You know, and as I think about it, Chris, I'm thinking about fitness in senior dogs and its importance. I think about the effects externally on the body, right? So we have, we're building strength and flexibility and body awareness. And having those things gives these dogs freedom. It gives them the freedom to get a drink, go outside to the bathroom independently, move into the shade or move into the sun when they want to bask, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but also... Think about the effects that are happening internally with movement and exercise. Every step engages muscles, tendons, ligaments. It's preventing muscle atrophy and the loss of bone density. Um, so, and, and then also, as the dog's moving, the body is sending messages to the brain, right? And then the brain sends messages back to the body on how to respond to their environment. And the result of that is this increased cerebral capacity and increased function. So as you can see, I'm super pumped <laughs> about this, this topic, Chris. Um, well, we, we've said many, many times over our dozens of podcasts, how we love senior dogs. I mean, right. that's both of our jams, you know? Right. right. So um, yeah, I'm super stoked as well. And, you know, earlier you said, you know, great for the body, of course, great mm-hmm. for the brain. 
right? Great for the soul, you know, and not just the soul of the the dog, but the human's soul, you know, to see, to see their, you know, their partner of many, many years, you know, continuing to, to be independent and thrive. Right. And nothing feels better in rehab than hearing from a client who has a senior dog who says, she picked up her ball this weekend. She jumped mm-hmm. on the couch. She hasn't done that in years. Nothing feels better than that. So anyway, I won't delay this any long because I'm super excited. So let me give you a little background on our guest. Um, Dr. Lisa Schmidt is a certified pet massage practitioner and a certified canine fitness trainer. So she's one of our peeps. Lisa also teaches at the Bobby Lyons Canine Campus and is the owner of In The Zone Dog Agility. Um, Lisa also teaches with Clean Run, which is a big deal because they're a big, uh, they're a big name in our community. Um, and she is also one of the most accomplished handlers in North American Dog Agility Council and conducts seminars around the continent on agility, conditioning, and massage therapy for pets. So please welcome Lisa to the show. Hi, thank you. I'm excited to be here. All right. Well, you heard the introduction. I want to get right to it. So I guess the first question for our listeners may be, how do people know, how do pet owners know when their dogs are senior or geriatric? Well, that actually is a really tough question. Um, And it's really dog dependent. Um, Like senior dogs, I, I divide senior dogs into senior dogs and geriatric dogs. Hmm. So I think of senior dogs as they're a little bit older, they may might be slowing down a little bit. um, But you know, they're still pretty active in doing stuff. Um, And geriatric dogs are the older dogs, they probably have more health issues, they have a harder time getting up. Those are the you know, the older, older dogs, Um, but both can absolutely still benefit from fitness. So Lisa, why don't we talk a little bit about what's special about fitness for seniors? I know we talked a little bit about that in our introduction, but let's talk a little bit about what seniors can do for fitness. So senior dogs, I think, like you said, I think a lot of people have the perception that you know, my dog's older, they don't need to, you know, they can sit on the couch and they don't need to do much. Um, But we need to keep our senior dogs moving and functioning. Um, So the more that we keep them moving, the better off they will be. Like you said, the more quality of life they'll have, they'll have more muscle tone, they'll have, they'll be able to bend and move and, and, you know, like you said, the brain, the, the brain is important. You know, the more you move, the more neurons you, your brain creates. So the mental aspect of fitness is really important too, and sometimes overlooked. Um, so like senior dogs, they, they need, they need to keep moving and they, they, they crave that attention. Um, You know, some, they don't want to just lay around on the couch. They love to do stuff with you. Um, I had my sister's dog. I probably started doing fitness with him. He was a beagle when he was about 15, 14 or 15 years old. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he died when he was 17. And I probably did fitness with him up to like two weeks before we ended up having to put him to sleep. And he looked forward to, as soon as he saw me, he would light up. And he was one of those geriatric dogs where mm-hmm. he actually, he was a foster failure. Um, he was hit by a car. His, like his, one of his back legs really didn't work all that well. And so we couldn't do a lot of the normal traditional exercises that I would normally do because he really couldn't like sit and down a lot, but we were able to walk over equipment. He could stand on stuff. We could do some weight shifts. We did lots of moving exercises. Um, and, and it made all the difference in the world. In fact, my sister, when I first started working with him, <laughs> she, we started laughing and she's like, I don't know if I want you to do fitness with him anymore because he's crazy. He started, <laughs> run, he started digging again. He got loose. He would dig out under the fence. He, he would run around <laughs> with his normal beagle, you know, howling. (laughs) Um, So it's great. All dogs can benefit from from some kind of fitness plan. 
it's nice to hear that he returned to, sorry for your sister, but it's yeah. nice to hear that he returned to a lot of his normal behaviors. Yeah. And um, I had a similar, you know, experience with a dog that came to me many years ago. She was a little like a uh, terrier Pekingese mix and she was 17 and her owner was complaining that she had, uh, she was calling it brain fog. Um, oh yeah. And, and I think that and no one would take her on as a client. And I was like, hell yeah, we'll take you on as a client. And we did some very simple things. I think that that's the other thing for owners that may be a misconception. We don't have to run these dogs for five miles. Um, right. There are some things that we could do very simply uh, in short session, maybe periodically throughout the day, you know, some yes. very easy things. So, yeah. And, and, but, and the human bond of it, the human dog bond and giving the dog a purpose and something to look forward to is so important with older dogs. You know, especially like dogs that were sports dogs, you know, they did agility, they did, you know, fly ball, they did all these activities until they were too old and they couldn't do it anymore. And then you got another dog and you got another dog. And so that dog kind of goes by the wayside a lot of time, you know, that happens sometimes. And fitness is something that you can do with your senior dog to make them, you know, feel important and have, let them do something again with you. You know, it's, it's so important. It is. And I think the dog set, you're right. Absolutely. I think that, you know, when, when you get your new dog or maybe two new dogs and your senior dog can't keep up with the pack for the walk and they go out and the senior dog has to stay home. I think that that is, that certainly makes them feel, I think, isolated and maybe yes. and, and yes. um, that feeling of helplessness, you know, nobody wants to feel that, you know? Yeah. Uh, so this is something that's, you're right. One-on-one -on -one special time. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, they, they, they can feel, uh, like you said, Kathy, isolated or, or forgotten. And, and, you know, I also have many heartwarming um, stories uh, once we start to do, you know, our physical rehabilitation, which is, you know, more than just the, the quote, exercises. Um, you know, we have many prongs of our, our therapy. But, um, you know, people will just tell me how transformative it is uh, just after a few sessions, it can make yes. such a huge, huge difference. And um, so, yeah, and, and, you know, and talking about, and I want you to maybe get into it a little bit more, Lisa, about some examples that you would do, but, you know, I, coming from the people world, you know, as a physical therapist for people for many years, you know, it's like, yeah, maybe when you're 22, you ran marathons and now, <laughs> you know, you're, you're 62. And so you ride the stationary bike, you know, you got a Peloton, all the rage. And then fast forward to 82. And maybe you're taking a Tai Chi class at the rec center and working on your balance and mm -hmm. flexibility and things. So as people, we preach the very same things for our healthy lifestyle, longevity, and preparing for that good death. You know, we don't want to be suffering, you know, in the latter years of our lives. We want to all be active, fulfilled, and have quality and meaningful relationships with our friends and family. So the same goes through go for our for our pets, definitely. So Lisa, can we talk a little bit about how um, and how you structure an exercise program for a senior dog? I imagine it must be sort of an individual thing. You know, your your maybe your 10-year-old Yorkie has got a different senior plan than your 10 year old great dane um let's talk about considerations first okay, okay. Good. so like um when i think about when i think about senior dogs you know we have to take into account each individual dog you know what the dog is in front of you today because the dog that's in front of you tomorrow or next week could be different so you always have to take into account the dog that's in front of you at this very moment in time during your training session. Um, you want to take into account, you know, obviously their age, um, their body condition, because a lot of dogs, especially senior dogs, can be a little fluffy. So, you know, I tell people that all the time too. Like you, you need to, um, first you should, you know, take your dog to the vet before you start any fitness program, especially with a senior dog. We want to make sure because um, as owners, we might not understand or see or know that, you know, they might have back problems. They might have, you know, specific issues that we have to take into account when we're doing stuff. You know, like Brock's leg, his, you know, his leg was wonky, but I, I knew how to de deal with it. Um, so, you know, always make sure you take your dogs to the vet first, get, get, the, get the all clear, 
before you start a fitness program. Um, but so, you know, we have to take into account if they do have any diseases, do they have hip dysplasia? Do they have elbow dysplasia? Do they have arthritis? Do they have something going on in their back? You know, so we have to, you know, look at the dog in front of us and say, what, what issues do they have? And as a fitness trainer, I have to make the decision, is this dog sound? And can I, as a fitness trainer, work with this dog? And if it's beyond my scope, um, then they need to go to a rehab person. You know, if that, we have a dog that has a really a bad back and it's under care, I, I, you know, you need to go to the rehab person. That's not my, that's not in my purview. <laughs> I also look at the dog's size, like you said, like a little Yorkie. Um, I'll do a few, you know, I have to make considerations for a little dog as opposed to the big dog and equipment and what equipment is a, one of those big issues when it comes to small dogs and big dogs. Um, let me see, what else do I look at? So I would look at their structure, you know, it, do their elbows, are their elbows pushing out? Are their knees sticking out? You know, I, I want to look at what their structure and their posture looks like. And you know, mentally, their behavior, their eyes. So like assessment is the, you know, go see a vet first. That's, you know, make sure you're, it's okay that you can, you can do a fitness program with your dog. And then assessment is the the next step. Um, and I think I'm, I, I'm really big into assessing my dogs. Um, I'm constantly watching how they move, how they sit, how, how they even interact in daily life. Um, but when I get another, when I get a dog in, I will look at their posture, right? The first thing, you know, I watch as they walk in the door, how are they walking? Are they using each leg individually? Are they hopping? Are they skipping? Is their back roach? You know, do they look like they're in pain? You know, so just by the way they walk in the door, I'm assessing them. Um, and then I will assess their posture. How are they standing? Do they have a sway back? Do they have an arched back? Do they, are their feet sticking out? Are their knees sticking out? Are they shifting weight to one side or the other? You know, do they look uncomfortable? Do they look okay? You know, do they look happy? Um, so I look at, I look at the stand. That's like the first thing I really look at. And I will look at their sit. How do they sit? Can they sit with proper form? Um, you know, are there, is a leg kicking out? Are they having weight all the way forward? Do they have weight all the way back? Do, are they flopping over? You know, um, I will look at mean, that. Do you mean like side sitting when you say flopping over? Yeah, yeah. Like a puppy like, sit? Like yeah. a puppy sit, yes. Yes, yep. like are their legs, you know, flopping over? Um, I'll look at how they down. You know, we want the stereotypical fixed, you know, obedience down, I think of in terms of when I think about explaining the down. You know, well, you want their legs in, you don't want them laying down on one hip. Um, you want them just, you know, weight equally. You want their feet forward. So I'll look and see if they can do that. Um, so posture is a big thing. And in normal day life, I will pay attention to it. But if I ask you for a good sit, um, I expect my dog, or not expect is the wrong word, but I will watch to see if they can do, if they can actually do it or, you know, or if they can't. Um, so if I ask for a good sit and they can do it, great. If they can't, then we need to look further as to why they can't do it. Um, but so we're and just Lisa, assessing now. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? So is, Absolutely. This, is this something as you're going through kind of your assessment routine that you would do with any dog? Yes. Um, but you may see, you may, or you may not, I guess, see uh, more problems or have different challenges with a senior dog just because of their potential issues of aging, such as muscle yes. atrophy or yeah. increased weight or stiff joints yeah. due to arthritis. But this is a similar assessment that you go through with every dog. Yeah, I do the same thing with all my, all dogs, but yep. you know, but, you know, the seniors, I don't want to say I pay more attention because I don't, but I probably do. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, I mean, and is this something <laughs> when you got your certification as a fitness trainer, because it's a relatively new certification, is this something that that, that uh, coursework teaches you is like how to go through this assessment and so forth with these pets? 
Um, oh, they, they, God, I was like the first batch. Um, uh, I was the first group that went through the program. So it's Good definitely for you. evolved, um, since then. And I've evolved since then. Um, so, uh, you know, Bobby Lyons is a good friend of mine and we, 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 we're always learning, always talking, always doing th- things and assessing. I'm always assessing animals, my horses, my dogs. So I'm th- every dog, every case, everything you see, you always go, Oh, I need to look at that again now. So you keep, you keep evolving. And so now my assessment is probably four pages long (laughs) because I have my big old form of my assessment that, you know, I've taken from the CCFT program. I've taken it from horse stuff. I've taken it, you know, I've developed my own stuff. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So I did learn a lot there, but, you know, you know, we evolve. I just wanted to say that, you know, I think this speaks to the importance though of having a professional, um, Absolutely. you know, yeah. going, doing this sort of program with your pets. So, you know, you said definitely reach out to your vet, which Kathy and I always, uh, profess as well. I mean, that's where you start to make sure that they're, um, well enough to participate yes. in any sort of program. And, um, and then, you know, look for those, you know, certification letters and the experience of the individual that you're, that you're seeking help from, um, because as you can hear, there's a, a lot that, that goes into it that you may not realize. And I also want to point out to people and tell me if you think this is helpful, Lisa, to take like periodic pictures and videos of your dogs. Because Absolutely. I think when, yeah. I think what, there's two things why I say that. And one is, you know, you live with your pet every day. And it's hard to see the micro mm-hmm. changes that may be happening. But if you look at your dog last year when they were nine and then fast forward a year later and they're 10, you know, time flies and you may not even appreciate the changes that are happening. But you look at that picture of that video and you can see like how uh, maybe their stride has shortened, um, they're stiffer, uh, your, their back is more rounded, they're holding their head lower. Um, and those details aren't uh, easy to recognize at all. But then you can also take those same images and bring them to your vet, you know, show them to your fitness trainer. Yeah. Um, so they really capture, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think in this case, that's definitely true. Absolutely. There's so much, there's so much information to be gained by simply watching the dog, assessing the dog, not only assessing the dog, but assessing the dog as you go along. So maybe we started with a sit stand and then we're ending with something else. And we see that the dog is either fatigued or tired. So I just, you know, I was going to say the same thing, Chris. I think it's really important that you have a professional um, assess the dog. So either your, your, your canine fitness instructors or your CCRPs, um, because simply watching the dog, even facial expressions, um, owners may not pick up on subtleties like that. Absolutely. It's funny. Just the other day I was talking about, I was looking at a dog that, you know, was offloading. So like it was weight shifted just a little bit. Like it didn't have full weight on one leg. And I was just telling somebody, I said, I remember when I first started my fitness journey, I remember looking at all these pictures and going, I have no idea what they're talking about. I can't see it. I can't Mm -hmm. see where the weight is shifting. Like, I don't know what they're saying. And now I look at it and go, "Um, oh yeah, yeah, that." you know, it's so subtle, but I can see it now. Um, yeah. So it, it takes time and, and experience uh, to, to see to see things. Yeah. Um, and the photos, so like with my non-senior dogs, I probably do the photo assessment. Um, so I, th- here's my big tip about doing that. I put my, I put my camera out so you can get your, even your phone or your iPod, iPad now, I GoPro, whatever. Um, and I will videotape my assessments. So I will videotape my dog walking, trotting, sitting, standing, and down from all different sides, forward, the back, and both sides. And then I go in and I take screenshots. I just do screenshots of of those parts and put them in documents. So that's, so you don't need somebody else sitting there taking a picture. You Mm -hmm. can use your phone, you can take it and just take screenshots and put them in documents. So, you know, January, 2022, tandem is 12. This is my sit photos. And I put them all in there. And then I put my stand photos and my down photos. And I've been doing this for years um, with him. And so it is really, it's 
good to see. Um, it's a good baseline to have too. So I could go back and say, oh, oh, look at, um, he was, you know, his leg was sticking out. Oh, now it's not, or it wasn't, and it is. And so anyway, it's a really good baseline to have too. And that's an easy way to do it, to do the screenshots. And with my senior dogs, I try to do it like four times a year. I try to do it every couple of months uh, because the changes happen more quickly. Um, and, and we want to pick this stuff up. You know, if your dog is kicking its leg out all the time or it can't sit straight anymore, um, you know, you need to go seek professional help. Go to your vet, go to your other, your healthcare team because something can be done about it. I think what we think about senior dogs is that, oh, they're old. You know, right. oh, oh, they're peeing a lot because they're old. Well, they might have a UTI. So go to the vet, get some medication, and you're good. your dog's good to go again, you know. Or, you know, oh, they're old. Well, they, there's pain meds out there. Give them pain meds. Mm -hmm. You know, give them something. Um, so, you know, I think that a lot of times people just think, oh, they're old, and they don't want to take their dog to the vet. But yeah. Right, and old age isn't a, a disease. <laughs> right? So, um, yeah. So, sussing. So, I do the picture thing. I always do that. I watch them gate. I will put cones out. If you don't have cones, I tell people I have sent my dog around my vacuum cleaner. Um, you know, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what it is. That's right. <laughs> and I, you know, watch them go around and see how they can, can they turn? Can they go around? You know, you don't want them falling, but, um, you know, that's important to watch them. I watch to see how they can turn in circles, you know, how, you know, assessing their flexibility. The, is the next step that you then formulate a, a plan for them? So you'll, what, is that the next step? We formulate a plan for them for exercise and what, what does that look like? Yeah. Um, well, it depends on um, the, what the person has too. Um, so my favorite pieces of equipment for senior dogs are, I love, love, love bounce pads and you can buy them on Amazon, the cheap, you know, you, the, the, and there's different sizes of balance pads. Um, so I have all different sizes of balance pads and they are human. I use human pads. I even bought human pads for my horse, although I haven't tried it yet. <laughs> um, and feed buckets, like the rubber feed buckets that you buy at a farm store and, and they're not slippery. Um, so if people have other equipment, so if they have fit bones or, you know, air platforms or, you know, whatever, then I could, we can use more equipment too. Um, but most of the time people don't have a lot of equipment. So I'm like, buy some balance pads on Amazon and you'll be good to go. Um, and so when I think about exercise plans for my senior dogs, um, one thing, well, not one thing, but you know, a very important thing is I want to do moving exercises with my senior dogs. I want to do something that gets them moving. Because a lot of times exercises can be stationary. Mm -hmm. You know, you stand, you do weight shifts, you can do sit stands, whatever. And you're not really moving. <laughs> um, so I always try to have, like, I have a senior monthly class at Bobby Lyons Canine Campus. So every month I have a senior, I come up with a workout every month for my seniors and I always have a moving exercise so examples of moving exercises are like cavalettis cavalettis are great um, can you describe but, what cavalettis are for people that don't know yeah so um they're bars basically bars that the dogs will step over um and it can be can I swear I'm going to swear kind of a pain in the ass <laughs> <laughs> to, to set up because you have, you know, like you put, yeah, some people, you know, you have cones, you have to put the poles in the cones, you have to go put them out, you usually have six or 12, and it could be kind of a pain to set it up. So I think a lot of people, including myself, um, underutilize Cavalettis just because they're, and you need room to set them up. Um, but I do do Cavalettis when possible, and if people will do them, I tell them to do them. Personally, um, I love Cavalettis. Yeah, I love them. I love yep. them. Um, they're so functional and so good for the dogs. Um, but, you know, there's other things that we could do, other kind of moving exercises too. Um, so even just setting two cones up and doing figure eights around cones, that's fantastic. You could add, a, you know, one or two poles if you don't want to set a bunch out. And then they have to step over those poles, go around a cone. 
um, like the buckets. The buckets are huge. I do a lot of having sending my dog trotting to a bucket and standing on the bucket with their front feet, stepping off, trotting, stepping back on the bucket, stepping off. So you're getting the trots, you're getting the step up, you're getting the step down, you're getting the turn, turn to go in the other direction. So just a simple exercise like that has big bang for your buck. You know, there, I, you know, any kind of moving, stepping exercises you can do, fantastic. So, um, so I do a lot of different variations of cones, buckets, and then I might throw some fitness stuff in there that you have to walk, you know, they have to trot over the balance pads that are on the ground. So you do a figure eight, they walk over the pads, they get off the pads, they go around the cone, they go back to the pads, walk on the pads, get off the pads, you know, stuff like that. So those are great, like simple but effective moving exercises. So that's a big, you, that's a big one. You raise a good point, Lisa, because, um, you know, I guess I've struggled with what qualifies as an exercise for an older pet because yeah. Yeah. sometimes, you know, to me, they're similar exercises, whether they're two or 12 Mm -hmm. It all depends, like you said early on, on the individual and their ability. But one thing that I that hadn't resonated or I hadn't thought of is about the moving component. And mm -hmm. generally, of course, you know, I'm like, yes, we need to keep our pets moving. And I tell our pet owners, you know, you've been sitting at the at your desk, for example, you should get up and, <laughs> you know, move around because it's not healthy to sit all the time. Have your dog come with you, you know, have them move. Don't let them get stiff by lying in one position all of the time. And, um, so, so that, that was a really good point. And, and if we can, maybe we can break down just briefly, uh, some of the benefits of the exercises that, that you mentioned. Um, so what I was hearing and why I love Cavaletti so much is it does force the pet to have to bend their limbs more, right? Mm -hmm. So they yep. get increased range of motion of those legs when they're picking up one leg to step over that rail and it's not a high rail usually it's about what the height of their their wrist maybe yeah low yeah usually yep, or low. a little lower with a senior yeah. um then they have to shift their weight to the other weight bearing legs as they lift the one up so they get a weight shift and more weight on those stance legs if you will as they're going over the rail so you're working on some balance and some strengthening and then think about the agility i remember like kathy's mentioned this in the past you know coordinating four legs yeah you know yeah. i can't coordinate two legs i'm tripping and falling <laughs> and running into furniture all the time <laughs> but you. you know that's something and again i think people can relate to that right we you know as we get older i mean my balance is not what it used to be <laughs> i trip on the slightest little you know the ledge on a sidewalk you know it's relatively flat but if it's uneven at all my toe catches it so i've got to pick up my feet i'm shuffling more and your dogs need to do the the very same thing and then when you were talking about going between the buckets that's kind of like a little shuttle a little shuttle relay yes. um and the turning because i always tell people that that walking in a straight line is exponentially easier than walking in a curve line so when we ask our pets to turn there is so much more brain to body messaging that needs to happen and you made the point of they're turning one direction and then they go hit the bucket and they turn the other direction so we're getting clockwise and counterclockwise turns they put their front feet up on that bucket that shifts weight to the hind end so not only does it take strength to get up there but to maintain that position typically dogs get weaker in the hind so we're taking a little bit of strain off those shoulders and neck and shifting that weight back and causing them to engage their muscles around their their hips and knees and such more that can get achy with age and start to atrophy. So does that kind of sum up what you're going after with these exercises? Yes. And you missed the stepping off part. So, oh, you know, tell me about that. Yeah. yeah what? You know, so they're, they're standing on the bucket and they yep. have to step off of the bucket and that requires stability and strength to step off of the bucket. Yes. I think that a lot of exercise trainers or people in in general forget about the dismount mm -hmm. <laughs> like the getting off part like you yeah. you do something and then the dog gets off and a lot of times i see people just throw treats and 
I personally cringe because a lot of my students will do it one time because I'm like, oh my God, stop. Yep. Um, because the exercise isn't over. You can reward your dog. I'm, I'm all for rewarding my dog and your dog, but make sure they get off safely. Yes. And then you can toss a treat if you want. And I actually use my buckets. I love the buckets. I turn them upside down and I will toss a treat into the bucket. That way the dog knows where it's going. Like, so they're not sniffing around and they're more focused on, you know, the exercise and they're not like searching the room for that lost Cheerio I threw and I can't, they can't find it. <laughs> you know, um, I'm so happy you said that about the dismount, Lisa, because I have noticed without anybody necessarily saying it, that that's when I have to really pay extra attention yes. because now they're, they're fatigued maybe from yes. the exercise. Mm -hmm. They were incentivized to get up there. They know they're going to get a treat or what have you. This is what you want from them. And then it's kind of forgotten and they're trying to get off. And that's when they stumble, they yes. twist, they, yes. you know, fall to one side, they trip. Um, and I've noticed that so many times and I, you know, just me working with, with the pets, I've noticed that. So definitely emphasizing that with the pet parents is a very very good point and that's why i love the balance pads and i own probably i don't know 30 well maybe not well i might own 30 pads i i keep buying them um because it, even <laughs> never if have you, too many <laughs> that's you right never have too uh, many balance pads. <laughs> no because so if you're if your dog is on a stool let's say you're they're, they're putting their front feet up on a stool that's what i did the other day um and i put balance pads around it so that if they move to the side or if I dismount them from the side, it's easier for them to go off to the side. If they move forward, they have a pad there also. If I move backwards, they have a pad there. So like I have balance pads normally all around stuff with, with my senior dogs. I don't do that a lot with my, you know, my non-senior dogs because they generally have the strength to step down. Um, but I worry about that, especially with my senior dogs. So I will make sure that I will have like almost steps with balance yep. pads. And right. if I don't use, if they don't use them, rock on, but they are there <laughs> if they need them. But to so your funny. point, then when they come off, then it's it's uh, increased shock absorption. So not as yes. much impact on those front limb joints, which often get yep. arthritic with age. And you're essentially elevating the ground, um, you know, bringing the ground up to them. So instead of going from the bucket to the ground, which may be 10 inches, now it's you know, six inches or something because that yeah. balance pad yeah. is four inches. Yep. Or yeah. So yep. got yeah. it. Yep. Uh, it's making me think as we're talking about these exercises and I'm getting very excited. My brain is going with all these balance pads. <laughs> I'm very excited about that. Um, but how often would you recommend, recommend these types of exercises for their senior dogs? So if I have a senior patient and they've got, you know, pretty good mobility, but they're, they're, you know, I just want to make sure that they move. I tell them to do a little bit of exercise in short session periodically throughout the day or aim for maybe three times a week. What are your thoughts on that? I agree with you totally. Um, so like a lot of times with my senior dogs, my moving exercises can be the warm up, a part of the warm up. Um, but a lot of times it is the exercise itself. So sometimes moving exercises are done on different days and strength training and balance training, those are done on different days also. Um, so. It kind of depends, but if you could do something every day, if your dog is still functional and can really sit and stand and stuff, every time you feed them, have them sit, stand, sit, stand, sit, stand five times, and then feed them. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's many things throughout the day, like you said, that we could work on to help build strength for our senior dogs. But in general, as a rule, um, even with all my dogs, I try to have fitness training three to five times a week, if possible, mm -hmm. if I don't have a competition. So if they are competing, then they definitely are resting before and after. Um, and my senior dogs, um, Tandem's still 12 and a half, and I had a trial last weekend, and he still ran, you know, two, three classes a day, and he still, you know, looks great. Um, and work. So senior dogs can still play long as they physically and mentally want mm -hmm. to compete. Because mm -hmm. um, I do see a lot of people out there running their senior dogs that A, physically they can't do it or they shouldn't be doing it. And B, they don't want to. <laughs> You're not engaged. Um, exactly. Yeah. Engaged. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, owner, but, yeah. the owners want to, and they don't. They aren't yeah. listening to their pet, like Kathy and I always yes. talk about. Listen to your pet; they're telling you something. You know, you yes. reminded me too when you said, like, you know, doing the sit stands. Nothing drives me more crazy than when when people say, you know, they may come in for rehab. Their dogs. 10. And they say, uh, you know, my dog was diagnosed with hip dysplasia as a puppy and I never asked him to sit. Oh. And you know, that, that is just a fallacy. And it, it brings to mind the old physical therapy adage of if you don't use it, you lose yep. it. Yep. And that's especially true for the seniors. So, yes. you know, safety first, and again, getting that yep. clearance and making sure yep. that it is a good exercise if you will but yep. sitting is functional and dogs have to yep. be able to get off the yep. floor and yep. the same thing with stairs you know um, yep. when it becomes yep. unsafe well sure or they may need a little help with a harness or sling but we want them to continue to be able to be independent and do those stairs in the home that they need to to feel normal and feel like a dog for as long as they can so you know we don't say oh well, I five years old, we're going to block those stairs because, you know, that's a lot of exercise and you shouldn't do that. You know, it's, um, I just say, continue to do what your pet will do, you know? Right. And one, one difference that I make with senior dogs for like, for that example, is that, so you can, you can do reps. So like, you know, five sit stands, but maybe your senior dog can't do five sit stands maybe he can't do a, he can only do two um but you can have him do one and just hold it for 10 seconds long as he has good form like we form is always important we want to always exercise with good form but if they can sit for 10 seconds that's great because they have to use their muscles to keep their legs in from falling over and Fantastic. if they can sit you know, if they can sit on a stool or a balance pad, you can put two pal you can you can actually stack the balance pads <laughs> um, so that they have to sit on something elevated. That's fantastic. It's okay. Like I think people think, oh, they're just sitting. No, if they are sitting with great form, a good form, mm -hmm. if their legs are in, their you know weights distributed correctly, it takes a lot of muscles to keep those legs in. Mm -hmm. You know, right. so it's okay to just do duration. So I do a lot of isometric exercises with my senior dogs, especially when they first start or when they're geriatric. So like with Brock, we did a lot of, okay, you're gonna stand, your front feet are on one pad, your back feet are on another, and you're gonna stand there. And we might do some weight shifts. I might, you know, you know, just do some head turns, give them treats, or maybe, you know, just gently push his shoulders over his hips. Um, but just standing and doing that is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So senior dogs can absolutely do those. It's well, so they're working hard and just standing. It's it seems so simple, but there really is. Oh, I mean, the hardest thing I have ever taught my dog in my whole entire life is to stand. <laughs> <laughs> well, you think about when you go to something where you have to stand in a line, how fatiguing yeah. that is. Yeah. Right. And, you know, it, and what your point about sitting and holding the sit, you know, I never really thought about it, but I would, when I was working with people and you put them in a position of proper posture, this yes. person is used to slouching. They're used to yep. succumbing with gravity and allowing the furniture, if you will, to support them. No, take the furniture away, put them in a good position and have them hold that. It actually hurts because they don't yes. have, they have not trained or engaged those yep. postural muscles. So love it. Love it. Yeah. I think isometric exercises are, is where to start with all dogs. Um, but especially senior dogs, you know, I want to make sure that they have the muscles to actually sit, um, for a few seconds before I ask them to do five sit stands. So Chris, I think this is a great time in the show to talk about our sponsors because we're talking about enrichment. We love enrichment. Indeed we do. And a lot of what we're discussing today is absolutely enriching for your senior pet. But if you need a little help along the way, there is a great product called a Dog's Best Life Box. A Dog's Best Life Box .com is great. You could get a one-time or a monthly or a quarterly subscription to their enrichment box. Everything that comes in there in that box is designed to enhance and entice and entertain your dog with smells and toys and treats. 
And I know a lot of times people think, you know, oh, my older dog, you know, doesn't play with toys anymore. But maybe they just need the right toy. Maybe they need something novel. Maybe they need something that smells different. So give it a try. We love the folks at a dog's best life box.com. And to receive your 10% discount, use the promo code PET POD22. That's P E T P O D 22, all capital letters, and you'll get 10% off of your first order. And you know what, Kathy? What? I used that very code this morning because I bought a new puppy kit for a former client of mine who got a new dog. And so, yes, I put in the promo code PETPOD22. So not only for your senior dogs, as we're discussing in this show, but any dog of any lifespan, they've got the product for you. P-E-T-P-O-D-22, all capital letters. Check it out touched on something um i'm going to circle back a little bit because you touched yeah, on, on, on uh, <laughs> you touched on um using exercises for warm-ups and so can we touch a little bit on maybe the importance of warming up and cooling down with seniors absolutely so warming up for all dogs all sports um and cooling down is absolutely important we want to make sure that um you don't just pull your dog out of a crate don't just pull your dog off the couch and say hey let's go run um and unfortunately, I still, in 2022, I still see teams do that in agility. And that is at all, every single one of my seminars, if it's agility or fitness, I will always tell them warming up is the, one of the most important things you can do. Um, because I, I, when I, and I tell everybody the story, um, when I was younger, like in my 20s or something, you know, I was playing softball and I'm never late. But the one time I was late, um, so I literally grab my bat, I run, you know, I'm like, you know, up next, I run, I whack the ball, I run to first base, and I cannot move. I am stuck on first base. I, I, I have just, you know, I didn't warm up, I drove for half an hour, and I couldn't move. I had just torn my muscles, everything was sore, they had to carry me off. Oh my oh gosh. My I mean, it was awful. It took a long time for me to recover because I had pulled my muscles because I didn't warm up. So even before I st started doing dogs, I learned the importance of, yes, <laughs> of warm up. warming up um, because you don't want to just, you know, pull your dog off the couch and say, oh, let's go do something um, because you can hurt yourself. <laughs> you can hurt them. And unfortunately, I, I experienced it myself. So, um, so warming up is really important. So with the senior dogs, I will I want to warm up a little bit longer, but maybe do less things. So here's my warm up. Um, so in in agility, we it's called shadow handling. But so you, I have the dog next to me, kind of like in a heel position, and we trot. We walk and we trot. I want to get the dog trotting and get blood flowing to the body. So we're trotting, and then you turn. Um, and I don't turn the dog towards me like they're going to go around my body. I turn the dog away from me um, so that the neck, the spine has to bend. Because if you just like turn the dog around you, they don't have to bend their body. They can just kind of go with you. But if you turn their head away from you and use a treat and have the treat right in front of their nose and you turn their head the other direction, they have to bend their neck. They have to bend yeah. their spine. They have to bend it's their tighter. body. They have to shift weight. It's tighter. Yeah. yeah and they're shifting weight. Um, so they're using their muscles and they're warming up. So like that turn is so important. And that is always a part of every single one of my warm ups and exercises. I will always do this. Walk, trot, turn my body, my dog's body in both directions. So that's the number one thing I always do. Um, the second thing that I will always do is side passing. So when the dog moves sideways, so if you're facing your dog, you're both facing each other, you both move sideways. <laughs> um, and I think that is such an underutilized exercise. And I think it's so important for sports dogs, but it's most important for uh, um, senior dogs, because as, as you know, as dogs get older, they really lose their muscle mass 
and they lose their ability to keep their legs in. So if you look at senior dogs, their elbows start turning out, their feet start turning out, their knees start turning out, they start splaying out a little bit, they start slipping a little bit more. It's because they're losing their muscles that keep their legs in. So, you know, they're adductor muscles. Um, so, and they're abductor muscles that keep them out, you know, move out. So side passing, moving the dog, so they're moving their legs sideways in both directions, um, is a warm up. So I do that as a warm up. And it's always a part of my exercises. I will do side passing. I will do pivoting. I will always do some sort of lateral strength um, exercise in every one of my uh, every one of my exercises because I think that is so important. And I don't know a lot of people that push it, um, especially in the agility world. Like as a warm up, I'm like, you need to warm up every one of my seminars too. I'm like, you need to do side passing. Let's do side passing. Um, because I think that's just such an important muscle group that gets kind of thrown under the table. Do you agree? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, we did a whole show. We did a whole show on warm up and cool down because it's yeah. so important. Um, and the, the lessening the likelihood of a dog getting an injury, like you said, with your softball uh, analogy, it, it's definitely going to, you know, we're going to try and prevent injury, but also cool downs. You know, sometimes I see people who do agility, they come right off the agility course and they pop their dog right back in the crate. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I think that's also kind of like a misconception. You know, I, if I, if I had the opportunity, what I'd like to do is come off that course, maybe take my dog for a slow, you know, walk, wind down, let them know that the activity is over and then sort of let them rest. Yeah. So um, let me go back to my warm-ups because I have a couple more I need to talk about. Um, well, and Lisa, to your point about the, the abductors and adductors, I always tell my clients that, you know, dogs primarily move forward. Right. And I think the older they get, the more ingrained that is because, again, it doesn't take as much uh, right. brain to body, you know, messaging, yeah. like I said before. Yeah. Um, as going sideways or in a circle or what have you. And so doing those, quote, out-of-the-box movements is not only great for engaging those muscles that, that get forgotten in everyday activity, but it's also great for, again, that mental exercise. Yeah, absolutely. How do I absolutely sideways that is very different for me and you know just not as rote as as everyday movement would be but yes carry on with your your warm-up well and it increases durons right the brain yep. the more you move differently the more brain cells your brain makes so it's important mm. for brain mm -hmm. function right? yeah um, absolutely you know that's that's my you know you always i always have things that I, you know, I'm going to learn more about. And so my current, my current obsession, I want to say is learning more about the central nervous system and the brain. So that is my, my newest, newest thing that I've been researching and Lisa, reading more about. Listen to our show on neuroplasticity with Amy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I will. I definitely will. Um, but okay, the warm ups. I want to try to make sure that I move the joints through their range of motion. So I do do at least you know, one or two sits, just so that they, they can move those, those joints and get them warmed up, you know, get the fluid flow into the joints mm -hmm. um, before we ask them to do it. And I don't care. I don't want to say I don't care about form, but I do a quick. So like sit, stand, sit, stand. So it's quick. So I, I'm not overly worried if they splay their leg out. I just go, okay, sit, stand, sit, stand real quick. Um, I want them to sit properly, but I do it quick enough that I think I can, you know, get away with it a little bit because I want them to move their joints. Um, and I'll do a little backing up and moving forward because I want to, because you said the dogs go forwards, they go backwards, they bend and they, you know, they bend, they go sideways. So we got to work, we got to warm those parts up of the body if we're asking them to do that. So those are parts of my warm ups um, for agility and for fitness. With my senior dogs, it depends on your dog's fitness level because that might be all that they can do when you first start. They might only do warm ups. <laughs> you know, they might do walking and turning and walking and turning, do a couple of turns, it's a couple of sits, and move sideways and then take a break. And they might be able to do that again. And that might be it. And that's okay. It's totally okay if that's what they, that's all they can do. Um, Celebrate where they time, are. 
Absolutely. And maybe next time they can do a couple something else. And that's where I would start with isometric exercises because, okay, we just move them around and you are moving because you're trotting like the, the warming up part. Um, and then, okay, maybe they can't, they can't do, you know, a couple sit stands. Well, they can sit on like the balance pads or they can just stand for a few seconds and do some weight shifting. You know, that's still helping them work and build on mu- build muscles and stuff. So cool downs. Okay. So in agility, my life in agility is I always park, well, I have a motorhome, but um, I always park, even if I could park ringside, because most of the time I can, because most of them are my own trials, but um, I park far away and I don't, I, I, I work out of my motorhome. So we walk and warm up to go to the agility field and then we cool down on the way back to the motorhome. So it forces me to do that by parking far away so there is a tip for everybody out there if you play sports i know it can be a pain and i say to myself if i can't do this if i'm tired then i shouldn't run my dogs you know because they need to cool down so i will cool down kind of in reverse order um so lisa i want to interrupt here because i love that that's brilliant again going back to people we say you know everybody's like i don't have time to exercise and so you park at the farthest end of the parking lot before you go into the store forces yeah. you to walk. You take the yeah. stairs instead of the elevator forces yeah. you to do the stairs. So you're inherently getting the desired exercise or activity yep. movement. And you built that into where you park at your trials. So yep. back yep. to the dogs, you're going to take your senior dog swimming. You know, maybe you park at the other end of of the yeah. lot so yeah. that you yeah. have a nice walk before you get to the water or you're going to the dog park and they're going to be playing. Same sort of thing, you know, walk from the, the car a distance to the, the fenced in dog park area. There's just so many examples where that applies. Love it, love it, love it. Well, and as you're walking, do some turns. Mm-hmm. You walk, you spin, you walk, you turn, you walk. You go sideways. So on your way to wherever you're doing, you know, don't just walk forward, (laughs) you know, add some spins, some turns, some sideways movements. There's a car, there's a car coming and, you know, approaching you have your dog sit, stand up, sit, stand up, car passes, you move on. Yep. 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 There's always ways we could, we can add in the fitness. So, yeah. So the cooling down, like I want to make sure they're not panting. Like I'm not putting them away if they're panting. Um, so I will, you know, do, I will walk them around a little bit. Um, I will do some little spins, but shorter, not so intense, kind of trying to just do slow turns. Um, and then I will just, I will walk, I will walk until they aren't panting and then I can put them away. And the not panting is indicative of their heart rate slowing down as well as their respiration, right? So yeah, super important to take that strain off those organs that, that we can't see, you know, we're not necessarily. Well, and that's something we can see. We can see them panting. So Mm -hmm. yeah, you don't have to check your dog's heart rate or check their pulse. (laughs) You could see if they're panting, if that tongue is hanging out, if that tongue is still hanging out, you need to keep walking. (laughs) And if that tongue is hanging out, you need to quit exercising. So, you know, a lot of people don't know that, that, you know, like the tongue gets bigger. Um, If your tongue gets, the dog's tongue's hanging out and it gets big, you need to stop um, and cool them down. So Lisa, as we're, as we're closing up, is there any one final thought you could leave with the audience? Any pearls of wisdom, any information that you'd like to share? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, there are many things in life. I think we need to take life considerations into account with our senior dogs as well. Um, slippery, slippery floors, I think, is the biggest, one of the biggest problems in homes for senior dogs. Um, because it goes back to the lateral strength, they lose their lateral, you know, they lose their strength to keep their legs in. Um, but it's really, it's slippery, right? And it shouldn't be for any, any dog shouldn't be. I don't like hardwood floors for any dogs. Um, but especially the senior dogs. Uh, so if your dog says, I don't want to go in the kitchen because there's tile, you know, you might not think it's because, you know, it's tile, but it is like, they don't want to walk on, they, they feel really unstable on unstable surfaces, and while I like to train on unstable surfaces, they are unstable, safe, not slippery surfaces. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I, you know, mats, carpets, yoga mats, 
you know, whatever you need to do for your dog, wherever they're at, they should have non-slippery surfaces on their floor in life in general, and especially on exercising, you know, slippery surfaces. So carpets, yoga mats, mats, whatever. Right. Um, and, and when you said like you do, you know, unstable exercises or whatever, like squishy things, yeah. um, tippy things, um, like you said, they're safe. They move, but your dog is not slipping upon right. those things. Their right. feet are staying planted because they have good traction on yep. the whatever it is, the pillow, the fit bone. And, you know, a lot of the professional equipment has nubs built in yeah. Yeah. Uh, for both neurostimulation and and uh, that traction. So, yeah, very, uh, very That's important. why I love the feed buckets, the, the rubber feed buckets from the farm store, because they're rubber and they're not slippery. They won't slip on the floor and they're not slippery on the top. So when the dog steps on it, it's not slippery for the dog. Um, so that, that's why I love those too. So that's a great point. I mean, I want people to, I always challenge people to look around their environs, you know, inside, outside, um, and see what you can use that's already there. You don't have right. to think about going out and, you know, spending hundreds of dollars on special equipment. If that increases your compliance to buy something yep. and make sure yep. you do it. That's yep. fantastic. But yep. many times we can use a couch cushion. We can use a broom and a mop for a Cavaletti. We can, right. you know, put out a, a garbage cleaner. can. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 So many Absolutely. things. Right. right. And to clarify something I said earlier, you know, I'm like, if you don't use it, you lose it. But again, be yep. smart people. Yes. Because, safe. you know, yes, yeah, safe. And, and watch how your dog is doing these things. So, yeah, when they were one, two years old, jumping in the back of your SUV yeah. was no big deal. No. I still don't love it personally, but, yeah. you know, they could do it. And, you know, now, you know, people just don't think, and now their dog is 12 and they're still yeah. expecting them and they're wondering why they're hesitating, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, you got to, you know, help them with a the harness or provide that, that step or the ramp, yeah. um, you know, so making the appropriate accommodations so that they can still participate, still use their muscles, yep. still, yep. still, um, you know, engage and feel independent, but safe, as you said. Wow. Well, we covered a lot today, Lisa. Thank you so much. This is oh, you're fun. welcome. Everything you touched on is just everything that Chris and I preach. It, it really, you know, about the mobility and independence and freedom. Um, and um, we got a lot of good information. So I really, I'm so happy that you joined us today. And Lisa, would you mind telling people where they can, our listeners, where can they find you? Um, so my website is in the zone agility.com. And I'm on Facebook in the zone agility. Um, there is a business page and a group page. And if you're on Facebook, you should join my group because I do post, um, I do post fitness tips, senior tips, agility tips in my group so um in my facebook group but yeah i'll put all those links up on in our show notes as i, I usually do and thank uh, you you bet and <laughs> well thank you lisa thank you very well, much thanks for having me i enjoyed it thank you, you lisa too. have a great day bye let's give a shout out to our sponsor heads up pets water collars found at save dogs from drowning.com and these are a unique floating collar that keeps your dog's head and nose above water at all times because the truth is that most dogs drown due to exhaustion. I've had a lot of people ask me about the Heads Up Pets water collar and why we chose them to be or why we partnered with them to, um, to be our sponsor. And I have to say it's because this product is so unique that it's different than your life vest. It's going to keep your dog's head and nose above the water, even if they become unconscious. So even if they have an accident, the head and nose is going to be held above the water. So this product is saving lives. And that's the reason we partnered with Heads Up Pets Water Collar. Uh, it's a great product. It saves lives. Matches our mission. And it matches our mission. So um, check them out at Heads Up Pets Water Collar um, or Save Dogs from Drowning. And uh, our friends Lynn and Kelly will be happy to help you uh, get your water collar for your dog. Definitely. Use a heads up water collar purchased with the promo code PETPOD20.
22, that's P-E-T-P-O-D-2-2, all capital letters, to get your 10% off, as well as support our show. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Petability Podcast. For more information about Kathy's books and living with blind dogs, please visit EnableYourPet.com. Thank you, and please tune in next time.